Wyandotte Valley United Methodist Church's remote worship for Sunday, May 2nd, 2021. This coming Saturday the 8th will be our plant sale, which this year will be only outdoors from 10 to 2, or as long as the plants last. And we invite you to stop by and get some, get some plants. Let us join in worship. Welcome. Please join me in the call to worship. Beloved friends, we gather together in love. Our love for one another reflects the true love of God. God's love has been shown to us through the gift of the Son. Our love for one another embodies the compassionate love of Jesus. We come together unafraid, for we know that perfect love casts out fear. Our love for one another is empowered by the fearless movement of the Spirit. And now, let us pray together. Dear God, your love is life-changing, but there are times we don't want to change. Your love is begging to be proclaimed throughout the world, but it's easier to just keep quiet. Your love challenges us to love all our sisters and brothers around the globe, but it just seems too difficult. Your love invites us to live in you completely, but it's so easy to turn our backs on you. Great God of love, open our hearts, guide our actions, restore and renew us. Prune away the unproductive wood and lead us back into new growth in the sunshine of your love. Amen. Justice was taken away from him. 
Who can tell the story of his descendants because his life was taken from the earth? The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, about whom does the prophet say this? Is he talking about himself or someone else? Starting with that passage, Philip proclaimed the good news about Jesus to him. As they went down the road, they came to some water. The eunuch said, Look, water! What would keep me from being baptized? He ordered that the carriage halt. Both Philip and the eunuch went down to the water where Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Lord's Spirit suddenly took, Phil took Philip away. The eunuch never saw him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip found himself in Azotus. He traveled through that area, preaching the good news in all the cities until he reached Caesarea. Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love will be revealed among us in this way. God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him, and he in us, because he has given up us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, A perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears us has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. For those who do not love their brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The command that we have from him is this, those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. The Gospel reading taken from the New Revised Standard Version is from John chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. Those coming for in-person worship at RVUMC this morning probably noticed quite a mess of natural grapevine wreaths on their way into the sanctuary today. Though I can understand if natural might not have been the first term, 
that popped into people's heads. A smaller trimmer, one from a bunch. Unrefined, rustic, simple and primitive would be other options. I give you permission to call them whatever seems right to you. I made them myself with my own two hands from our own wild grape vines. On the one hand, I felt horticulturally virtuous to be part of removing a good quantity of one of the Hudson Valley's top 10 invasive plant menaces from our patch of earth. On the other hand, I got to feel artsy-craftsy like I was actually making something. On the third hand, wait, I only have two hands. But especially in the early stages of each reef, it would have been mighty handy to have three hands to work with. Because those vines got really long. And they did not always want to curve in the directions that I had in mind. Truth in gardening alert, though, I did very little of the actual vine eradication. That was fine. I provided more post-extraction repurposing of the mess. And one thing that I realized in the midst of making the reefs was that a couple of days after being cut out or uprooted, the vines become stiff and dry and no longer conform to any new shape. It's obvious that you are no longer dealing with a living plant. When the vine is alive, everything from the thick stem near the base to the little coiling tendrils at the extremities that snag on everything, everything is actually pliable and supple. When I was trying to sort strands the first day with a jumbled pile of many, many strands, it was possible to pull on one end of a vine and then see just which end and which part of the ball of weeds was connected to that, 10 feet away. Cut the stem, pretty soon all of it is dead. Suddenly all that talk about abiding in Christ, of Christ abiding in us, started to make down-to-earth sense. Jesus' words in John 15, comparing himself to the vine, his followers to branches, and God to a pruning gardener are a true-to-life garden image of our abiding and our connectedness. And connectedness in the living Christian community takes a shape that is both very specific and totally amorphous. Love. I can't tell you exactly what love will look like for any specific person at any particular moment. But it is absolutely clear that love is what Jesus expects his followers to be about. If you are connected to God and to others through faith in Christ, if you're abiding, you will bear fruit, and that fruit is the fruit of love. And just as different settings and different conditions bring about different fruits, you wouldn't easily grow mangoes in Alaska or cranberries in Guatemala, so love will look different from person to person and place to place and time to time. The Johannine writings, Gospel and Letters of John, make the connection between the connectedness in and to Christ, our abiding, and the manifestation of love so often that it's hard to ignore the connection. For example, in this morning's reading from 1 John, the word abide occurs six times in the New Revised Standard Version, and love occurs 27 times. And that's all in the space of 15 verses. In the eight verses from this morning's Gospel reading in John, abide pops up eight times. And just for context, John 15, from which the Gospel comes this morning, is in the middle of Jesus' farewell discourse to his disciples at the Last Supper sandwiched between his famous new commandment for his followers to love one another, which is in chapter 13, and then again later on in chapter 15. These are among the last instructions he will give them, and you can tell he's not about to waste those precious hours with inconsequential issues. Love is what matters. 
being connected matters. Being connected in love really matters. The variety of expressions of love and the distance over which Christian connectedness can abide are described in the wonderful narratives of the Book of Acts. Think back to this morning's first reading. And one of the things that I found disorienting in these post-Easter weeks, when the lectionary is providing a reading from Acts every week, is that the selections, week to week, are quite a tangle in place and sequence. Chapter 10, then chapter 4, the next week, chapter 3, then the week after that, chapter 4 again, today, chapter 8, next week, chapter 10, then chapter 1 for two weeks, and finally, chapter 2 on Pentecost. The hodgepodge of people, places, and things in Acts is especially acute this week when Philip is directed by an angel of the Lord to travel from Jerusalem down towards Gaza. Directed by the Spirit, Philip ends up in deep biblical study and faith sharing with a high-ranking Ethiopian court official who is a eunuch. Returning to Ethiopia, Ethiopia after worshiping in Jerusalem to the extent that he barred from complete participation in temple worship by virtue of his status as a eunuch, to the extent that he could participate. The Ethiopian eunuch is reading Isaiah, and what he is specifically reading is what are is sometimes called Isaiah's Songs of the Suffering Servant, from chapter 53 in this case. Not mentioned in Acts, but connected in my mind as I looked at it this week, is the assurance three chapters later in Isaiah, of God's blessing and honor upon the just and the righteous, in spite of their status as foreigners or eunuchs. Hearing the good news about Jesus, the Ethiopian joyfully realizes there is no impediment to his immediate baptism, so they hop out of the chariot then and there, and Philip baptizes him. Then, boom, Philip is snatched away by the Spirit, and found himself at Azotus, which is a bit north of Gaza, whereupon he continues his journey, but in the opposite direction from when he started, winding up eventually up the coast in Caesarea. It's enough to give you whiplash, and between today's reading and bouncing from chapter to chapter, I was, I have to be honest, kind of irritated with the lectionary, wishing they just, you know, settle down and act normal and linear and predictable. But then it hit me. Maybe the lectionary isn't about to settle down and be linear and predictable because maybe our lives and the acting of the Holy Spirit aren't linear and predictable. And maybe we are supposed to understand that we are connected to one another in faith and connected to our Lord across all of the hard and fast boundaries that we have created and curated in time and space and language and culture. I have to admit that what I understand church and specifically my congregation to be has changed over the past pandemical year. Virtual worship and the increase in online church going meant that even though barely anyone was in the usual sanctuary, there could be several individuals or several dozen individuals, perhaps many, many miles away, worshiping remotely with us. Maybe if you're one of those, you're watching at the same time that we are gathering for in-person worship. Or maybe you're dropping by at 2 a.m. on Tuesday or noon on Sunday. Connection has never seemed more important. Space and time, not so much. I thought about that importance of connection relative to space and time this week when hearing of the death of Michael Collins, one of the Apollo 11 astronauts. Collins was the one who stayed in the command module orbiting the moon for 22 hours while Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin actually walked on the moon. As the NPR coverage this week noted, as he orbited, 
He could talk to controllers half the time, but when he was on the backside of the moon, he was completely cut off. It was because of this part of the mission that some dubbed him the loneliness, loneliness, loneliest man in humanity. As he recalled in a 2016 interview, he didn't think of it that way. He said, the fact that I was out of communications rather than that being a fear, that was a joy because I got mission control to shut up for a little while, every once in a while. When he was on the in communication side of the moon facing the Earth, Collins observed, the thing I remember most is the view of planet Earth from a great distance, he said this later, tiny, very shiny, blue and white, bright, beautiful, serene, and fragile. Even out in space, even unconnected from all that was familiar, Collins knew where home was, and I think that probably helped keep him grounded, pun intended, when he came down to Earth. Down to Earth. Solid, rooted, debatable, abiding, connected lovingly with others is not simply a nice churchy idea. It's a fundamental human idea. And it's probably why the varieties of isolation and shutdown and pause and whatever you want to call it over the past 14 months have been so disorienting to people. We need to connect. And we've had to learn completely new ways to do it. Research over the decades shows that even relatively short periods of under a week of extreme isolation and sensory deprivation seriously mess with your mind. Being disconnected and isolated from others is not who we are as humans, and emphatically not who we are to be as Christians. Abide. Love one another. Love should be who we are, and love should be what we do. None of this is rocket science, but it's still important to remember every single day. Today, in in-person church, we're celebrating Holy Communion, which is a visible reminder of our connection, not just with one another, but with our Lord Jesus Christ, who told his very first disciples to do this in remembrance of me. This afternoon will be our district conference when we connect, this year again by Zoom, with our brothers and sisters, not exactly adjacent to us in time and space, but adjacent in the abiding love of Christ. The connections are real even if you can't see all the way to the end of the vine right away. You just never know. One of the many surplus knowledge nuggets I stumbled across this week was when I was wondering what became of the Ethiopian eunuch after Acts 8. The short answer is we don't know and there's nothing more about it in the Bible. But Ethiopia is home to the largest pre-colonial Christian church in Africa, dating back to the very earliest centuries after the incidents of Acts. And it's home to, in a monastery in the northern Tigray region, which has lately been in the news, the oldest complete illuminated manuscript of the Gospels, the Garima Gospels, I may be mispronouncing this, dating to about the year 500. Makes you think, doesn't it? Finally, back to the vine reads. I expect that I made enough so that everyone who came to in-person worship today could take one. Take one home. Please, please take one. Consider it a springtime challenge to finish them off by filling with appropriate spring flowers or whatever. Have some fun. Hang it on a tree limb for birds to nest in or maybe drop it off under cover of darkness at a neighbor's house for a nice surprise. The only thing I ask is that you tell me at some point in the coming month what you end up doing with. I say to you what the people in Acts so often seem to be saying to the Spirit, 
surprise me. Amen. Let us pray. In peace we pray to you, Lord God. For all people in their daily life and work. For our families, friends, and neighbors. And for those who are alone. For this community, the nation, and the world. For all who work for justice, freedom, and peace. For the just and proper use of your creation. For the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. For the peace and unity of the Church of God, for all who proclaim the gospel, and all who seek the truth. For our Bishop, Thomas Bickerton, our District Superintendent, Carol Monk, and all the other leaders of our churches, for all who serve God in his church. For the special needs and con concerns of this congregation, hear us, Lord, for your mercy is great. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. Now, hear as we pray, as you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen.